Okay, so it's a little bit after 12, so I think we can uh, begin this morning's webinar. So uh, firstly, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, ESRI webinar on uh, the public understanding of climate change and support uh, for mitigation. So uh, as I think you, you all know, what we're going to be hearing uh, today is um, about a study from the ESRI's behavioural research uh, unit, in particular Pete Ron and Shane Timmons uh, are going to give the, the, the presentation. And uh, I think I said in a tweet earlier on uh, in the week, the, the, the work of the ESRI's behavioural research unit uh, obviously became incredibly prominent uh, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, both sort of very important to the, the, the work of the Institute, but obviously took on a, a national character. Uh, but it, it, it's great for a variety of reasons. It's great to be talking about something other uh, than, than, than COVID today. Uh, and it's it sort of, you know, this might seem a strange thing to say, it's great to know there are other issues. Now, unfortunately, there, there are very challenging and difficult uh, issues. And of course, climate, uh, the, the issue we're going to be talking about today is, is amongst the most difficult. Uh, but it is fantastic uh, to sort of hear the sort of methods and the insights that the behavioral team have become so uh, sort of familiar to many people uh, over the last while applying those uh, those methods and that style of thinking uh, into this um, this next crucial issue. So uh, I should say the, the, the study that we've been talking about today was actually funded uh, by AIB, and we're very grateful to AIB uh, for having provided the funding. I should quickly move on to say uh, that we, the SRI, are, are, are solely responsible, and, and in, indeed even the authors are solely responsible uh, for the conclusions and uh, the ideas that are being uh, put forward today. So AIB generously supported the work, uh, but then let us off uh, to do exactly what was going to be needed. So the plan for the next hour or so is uh, Pete and Shane are go both going to do uh, a part of the, the, the presentation and they'll take you through all the issues and the experimental design and, and the results. Uh, and I'm hoping at that we'll Sure, I think towards the end we will have time for some questions and answers. So, as you'll all be familiar with, if you can just submit your questions and answers uh, through the Q or at least submit your questions through the Q and A function uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, towards the end of the uh, the session, I'll do my best to moderate uh, and put the questions to Pete and to Shane. So, hopefully, uh, this can be as lively and engaging a uh, discussion as possible. So, uh, with that, I don't think there's any need for me to say anything. Uh, additional, um, but it's a real pleasure to hand over, I think, to Pete in the first instance. And uh, Pete, you're going to kick things off. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, Alan. I stress to add that I am going to kick things off, but Shane is going to do all of the heavy lifting here. Um, I'll come back in for answering questions and helping him with those at, at the end. I'm just going to do a little bit of a scene set with no slides, just a couple of minutes here. Um, because, I mean, it, we're really, really happy to publish this today. Uh, this was work that we were had already started when COVID hit and has been delayed as a result of all the work the unit has done on COVID. So it is lovely, actually, to come back to something else and, and publish uh, something that's not COVID related and get back to this work. It's really nice to be able to do that. Um, but climate is an area that the Behavioural Research Unit is really keen to move into, and I mean, we are actively seeking more funding and more collaborators in this space, and there's a specific reason, I think, which is, as a group of behavioural scientists, we're very much of the view that the role that behavioural science can play in tackling climate change um, is understated and is perceived to be too narrow. Um, so typically when behavioral science or behavioral economics is brought up in the context of climate change, uh, it's brought up as being all about kind of nudging people into greener behaviors. Now, you know, we're happy to do work on nudging people into greener behaviors, and we have done in the past, in fact, but the role that behavioral science can potentially play uh, is much greater than that. And the study we're going to present today, I think, gives a first indication of that, but it really is only a first indication. Um, the psychology and behavioral aspects of climate change are very, very different from almost all policy problems I've worked on before. Uh, in terms of the demand for collective action over such a long time scale and intergenerational collective action, where we're expressing essentially solidarity with people yet to be born in our behavior, that makes the climate change problem highly unusual from a behavioral and psychological point of view. But on top of that, the solutions require people to engage with highly complex systems in multiple aspects of their lives, covering many different behaviors, quite a lot of technical and scientific information, different kinds of economic systems. And as behavioral scientists, we'd be very, very firmly of the view that while education might be a very important part of the answer, it's gonna take an awful lot more communication than 
education to do this um, and to solve these kind of policy problems. And what that means is that people's comprehension is really important. What it means is that their perception of problems and their perception of the different components of the problems that we are asking them to make sacrifices to solve or make changes in their lives to solve is really important. It raises issues of willingness to adopt technologies and how to support that process. And it also raises really important issues of fairness where we are asking people to change quite fundamentally aspects of their behavior. And whenever you ask human beings to do this, they're super conscious about what everybody else is doing and what the distribution of those changes is. So we think the role of behavioral science is much, much broader than just nudging green behaviors. And behavioral science is increasingly producing multiple methods to be able to do this. Um, today, we're gonna to present an online study, but it's not just a survey. Uh, it contains within it uh, an experimental manipulation that allows us to make causal inferences that people who design surveys like us, we often design surveys too, cannot make. So it has those methods, but also we have the opportunity to use uh, field trials and other behavioral methods to try to tackle these problems. So as a scene setter, um, what I'm trying to say here is that this is really the first step the unit is taking in this direction, and we would view behavioral science as having a very important role to play in this space, and I'd happily take some more questions about that as well as exactly the sort of specifics of what we present today. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over, having done the easier job, to Shane to do the much harder job of presenting this study, so thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pete. And yeah, I'm just going to share my slides to kick things off. Um, okay, thanks everyone for, for coming along today. Um, Pete's um, done quite a lot of the introductions. I'm going to get straight into just some previous research that informed what we did. Um, so I'm going to start off with some polls that were done last year. The first is from the Eurobarometer. This was run in March and April 2021, where people were asked how serious a problem they thought climate change is. And you can see here that the vast majority said it's a very serious problem with much of the remainder saying that it's fairly serious. However, in October uh, last year, so this is when our study was run, the Irish Times uh, reported that a poll showed high degree of public resistance to many potential climate action measures. Uh, looking at the details of this poll, where most opposition um, lay was with higher taxes on energy and fuel and making it more expensive to buy petrol and diesel cars. So what we have here is a fair bit of overlap between people who say that, the, that climate change is a very serious problem, but people are opposed to making it more expensive to pollute the environment. So that's related to policy problems. We also see this apparent contradiction when it comes to individual behavior. So we know that eating meat is um, harmful for the environment and that reducing your meat intake is one of the most effective actions you can take. But this poll from uh, the EPA back in December showed that 61% of people rarely or never considered not eating meat for environmental reasons in the past year. So again, we have a fair bit of overlap here between people who say that climate change is a serious problem, but people not necessarily engaging with those uh, climate friendly behaviors. So the issue we have is that although people say it's a serious problem, support for it does not necessarily lead to support for effective solutions. So when we came at this problem, uh, we thought that maybe the, the answer to it lay in providing people with better information. So if we give people better information about climate change, will they then support those effective solutions? So that's what we set to do originally. Um, but in order to provide people with better information, you need to know what they know now. So when we looked around to see, okay, well, what do Irish people know about climate change? We found that there's actually nothing in this space, uh, nothing in this space had been done before. So what do people already know? Our aims then, the first one was to provide the first measure of understanding of climate change among a representative sample of adults in Ireland. And the second one then is to test that link between comprehension and willingness to change. So does engaging with better information on the climate science lead to a stronger willingness to change? So for today, I'm gonna to break our, our study up into different parts. I'm gonna first go through the sort of survey of understanding that we have, and then go through an experimental component that, that Pete mentioned where we test that link between comprehension and willingness to change. So in terms of the study design, the main task that people engaged in with the study was a 10 minute climate science quiz. Um, the quiz covered the day-to-day -day causes of climate change, its effects, ways to reduce impact, as well as things like the relative contribution of different sectors of the economy, how Ireland fares versus other countries, the pace of change and so on. To give you an example of the kinds of questions that we asked, 
Most of them were multiple choice questions or checklists where people could select all that apply. So for example, in terms of the day-to-day the -day causes of climate change, we have a question here about which of the following emit greenhouse gases, bicycles, diesel cars, electric cars, hybrid cars, petrol cars, planes, and so on. Um, so people could select any of those that they thought emit greenhouse gases. Another question here, this is about sectors of the economy. Um, so in this case, people were asked to choose the three sectors they thought are responsible for the most emissions in Ireland between the residential sector, waste, transport, industry, agriculture, and energy. And final example here is how do you think the amount of greenhouse gases per person uh, in Ireland compares to uh, other countries in Europe? Are we in the highest 25%? Are, you, are we in the highest 50%? Are we in the lowest 25%? And this is important. We're not asking people, we're not expecting people to know the exact level of greenhouse gas emissions, just the general gist here. Are we performing good? Are we performing um, poorly? So uh, for the first part of this presentation, I'm just going to give you some examples of the, the um, responses that people gave when they were asked um, some of these questions. So our first basic question is, why is the Earth's atmosphere warming? Um, when we ask people this question, what you can see here is that in this human activity grouping, we have about 90% of responses. Understanding of the exact mechanism that human activity, such as burning fossil fuels, releases gases, about three quarters of the population are familiar with the, the exact mechanism there. But overall, we have 90% of the population attributing uh, uh, the Earth's atmosphere warming to human activity and not nature, and a very, very small proportion there don't believe in climate change. Compare this to international figures in the UK, human uh, attributed climate change is at, at about 70% and in the US it's between 50 and 60%. So we're doing well on this question um, by international standards. Turning to the question about day-to-day -day, um, emitters of greenhouse gases, when it came to the energy sources, we had fairly good understanding um, of uh, the day-to-day -day energy sources. So we have coal, gas, oil, the vast majority of people are aware that those emit uh, greenhouse gases um, and not the, the renewable energy sources. And similar with transport. So people did quite well on this question where you can see our diesel and petrol cars, as well as planes, over 90% of people are aware that these emit greenhouse gases. There might be some confusion between hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles here. We can see about a third of people weren't aware that hybrid vehicles do emit greenhouse gases. Where understanding was, um, or where the performance was, was less well, was um, with the sectoral contributions of the economy. So here we have those six sectors that I, that I outlined before, and the source for this is the, the EPA. Um, in Ireland, the agriculture sector um, contributes the most, followed by transport followed by energy, which is, which is quite close to, the, to industry. Um, and then the, the lowest contributions come from the waste sector, just about 3%. When people are asked to choose the three that they thought emitted the most, um, what you can see here is that there was a fairly widespread recognition of transport, but on agriculture, which again is the, it contributes the most per sector, we have about one in three people that believe that it's not in the top three. What's important here is it's not a denial of agriculture as a contributor of emissions. Um, and I'll also flag that there was no urban rural difference here, that they're in a couple of percentage points of each other on this question. Um, but instead, it seems to be just an underappreciation of the scale. Similarly, when it comes to our emissions per person versus the rest of the EU. Um, so again, we just asked people, are we in the highest 25%, highest 50% or lowest 25%? we have less than half of people getting it right. So a majority of people are underestimating our emissions per person versus the rest of the EU. We asked um, the question here, so the correct answer is in the highest 25%. The uh, Eurostat actually estimate that we are the, the third highest um, in the EU. Effects of climate change, there was good understanding here where you can see across the board what most of the, the effects of changing biodiversity, melting ice caps, more drought and wildfires, more evaporation, ocean warming. People had good understanding of this and good, good awareness that these um, are effects of climate change. Um, less well understood is that uh, climate change can lead to the spread of um, infectious disease. And you can see some misconceptions there that maybe um, climate change might lead to increasing the hole in the ozone layer. But broadly speaking, we think effects of climate change are, are quite well understood. However, when it comes to the relative impact of individual actions, we asked people a series of uh, individual asks, uh, we showed people a series of individual actions and asked them whether they thought each one 
had a low impact on an individual's carbon footprint, a moderate impact or a high impact um, on, on reducing someone's carbon footprint. I've selected some of them here, and there's, there's plenty more of these in the report, uh, and plenty more questions um, and, and response sets in the report as well. What we found was that when people are asked about buying only local food and buying uh, only unpackaged food, a third of people thought that this was a high impact action that you could take to reduce your, your greenhouse gas emissions. In actual fact, it has quite a it makes quite a low difference. Um, now, we're not saying that things like buying local food in general is not going to help the environment. It will, but it's just that relative impact um, is lower. On the other hand, eating a plant-based diet is one of the highest impact actions that you can take to benefit the environment, but we only have about a third of people aware of that. On this question, in fact, and, and on the other ones, you can see that we're nearly at chance level in terms of people estimating how well uh, the difference that individual actions can, can make on the environment. Now, not all questions were at chance level. Um, so here you can see that we have about 50% of people thought that if you switch from a conventional care to a hybrid care, it's going to have a high impact on the environment whereas the real estimate is, is about a moderate effect. In general here, though, what this suggests is that although people are aware of things that can be done to, um, to benefit the environment, understanding that relative difference between different actions um, is, is quite poor. So that's just a summary of the measure of understanding that we did. Um, again, there's, there's multiple more questions in the report, um, and it was a bit of a struggle to identify ones that are the most interesting. There's plenty of interesting ones in there. So I do um, recommend people to, to look through it and they're all, they're all in charts throughout the report. Um, but for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on that link between comprehension and willingness to change. Now, for this, we didn't want to just correlate and look at, OK, do people who know more support uh, have a greater willingness to change? We wanted to test what we call the causal link. So does engaging with more information on climate change increase people's willingness to change? So to do this, and this is the experimental component that, that Pete mentioned earlier, we took our sample of 1,000 adults. This is a nationally representative sample, and they were divided randomly um, into two groups. One group, as they were completing and after making their guesses to the questions, they saw the answers to the questions afterwards, whereas the other group didn't see the answers. So they are our control group. And I'll just give you a quick example of what that looked like for people in the, the answers condition. So after being asked the first set of questions, they were shown the answers, just quite straightforward as this. Um, for example, that the Earth's atmosphere is warming because human activity releases gases, and that carbon dioxide and methane are gases that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. And then you can see here that it explains that fossil fuels release carbon when they're burned, which combines with oxygen in the air to make CO2. This means coal, gas, oil-powered heating all emit CO2, and so do diesel, petrol, and hybrid vehicles, as well as planes. So fairly straightforward, they had, they had made their guess to these questions, then were shown the answers afterwards. And again, whether you saw these answers or not was determined completely at random. We then wanted to see, okay, do the people who were randomly selected to see the answers, do they differ in their support for mitigation afterwards? So um, for now, I'm going to focus on the carbon tax. We explained the carbon tax to people that increases costs for businesses that use fossil fuels for energy and manufacturing. And also that it increased costs for households that use fossil fuels for home heating and petrol or diesel to fuel their care. We told them that the aim of the carbon tax is that increased costs will encourage businesses and households to rely less on fossil fuel and shift towards more sustainable energy sources. And then we told them roughly how much it costs, the, the carbon tax costs for, for households. So for example, that it adds 440 to um, a 40 kg bag of coal. Um, 30 euro to the average household's bi-monthly gas bill or um, nearly 11 cents to a litre of petrol or diesel. So everyone was given this information, but we also wanted to see, as well as the answers to the quiz, whether information specifically about how the carbon tax is used in Ireland would make a difference. Um, so this is where we go back to our experimental design. We're going to take our two groups that we split earlier. Again, this was just done randomly, and we split them randomly again. So these two groups here that I'm showing, neither of these had seen the answers to the quiz. One group then were given information on how the carbon tax revenue is used in Ireland. So it's ring fenced and, and put aside for, for specific uses. And the other group didn't see this information. And then we did the same with the group who had seen the answers while completing the quiz, where one group didn't see the tax information, one group saw how that, that, uh, the tax revenue is used. 
So essentially what we have here is about 500 people in the survey who saw the answers, 500 people who didn't see the answers, and the same for the tax information. 500 people saw tax information, 500 people did not see the, how the tax revenue is used. And then we want to see how that affects their support for carbon tax. So just to, sh to show you a quick example of what the, the tax information group saw, um, I won't read through, through all of this, um, but you can see that the, the money, they were informed that the money is ring-fenced and put towards investment in residential and community energy efficiency, targeted social protection interventions, pilot environmental programs in agriculture, and other green investments. And there's some examples there. To measure their support then for the carbon tax, we asked them two questions. Uh, the first is, to what extent do you think the carbon tax can encourage businesses and households to shift towards more sustainable energy sources? So just generally, is the carbon tax likely to be effective? Do you believe the carbon tax will be effective? The second one was um, that Ireland's carbon tax is currently set at €41 Euro per tonne of carbon. Given what you know about the carbon tax, what would you set the price per tonne of carbon to be? And they could move it either up, down, or leave it where it is. Um, and we'll show you now um, how people responded to those questions. Um, so firstly, on that just belief question, so they're just asked to rate how likely they thought it was that the carbon tax could encourage businesses and households to shift their behavior um, from, one at all, uh, from one, not at all, to seven, a great deal. And this is the, the distribution of responses. So you can see that the, the most popular option here was five, that people kind of um, tended to give an option towards the upper end of the scale. So there is some belief there that the carbon tax can be effective on average. I'm now going to show you the average rating that people gave, depending on the group they were in. So remember that this was done, that, that whether you saw the answers and whether you saw the tax information was decided completely at random. Um, so if that information has no effect, we should see on average people give the same response. When it comes to seeing the tax information without having seen any of the answers to the quiz, you can see that bears out. So there's no difference here on average between people who saw how the tax revenue is used and people who didn't, if they hadn't seen the answers to the quiz earlier. However, in both groups, um, those who had seen the answers to that climate change quiz earlier, which is a 10 minute climate change quiz, they saw the answers to the questions. And then later on in the study, they thought that the carbon tax could be more effective at shifting behavior. To give you a um, brief estimate of the kind of effect size of this difference, we had about 29% of people gave a six or a seven on the scale if they didn't see the answers to the quiz, whereas 37% of people gave a six or a seven if they had seen the answers to the quiz. And these answers to the quiz, remember, they were not specifically about the, it was about, about the climate tax itself. So what this suggests is that um, greater, uh, great, there's greater belief in carbon tax after engaging with the quiz answers, but no effect of seeing how the revenue is used. Okay, well, what about how much they would set the carbon tax to be? So remember, we explained to them that this has a real effect on households, um, on, the, on the cost of fuel, for example. Um, people could set it to um, what they thought the carbon tax should be. So from 41 euro, move it up or down. And I've grouped the responses here just to make it a bit easier to see. If we look at everyone in general, you can see that it is a somewhat divisive question. Um, so we have about uh, 45, 46% of people increase the tax. 22% uh, of people decreased it, and the, uh, sorry, 22% of people left it the same, and the, the rest, the, the remainder then thought the tax should be decreased. What I'm going to show you here now is how that varied by whether they had seen the answers to the quiz earlier on in the study. Again, this was decided completely at random. Um, I'm not going to show you the, the results for whether they'd seen how the tax revenue is used, because again, this had zero effect. So there was no effect of seeing how the revenue from the carbon tax is used. Um, but we do see an effect here of whether they saw the answers to the quiz earlier. So without the answers, this is our control group and probably how the, the population in general would respond. You can see 20% of people didn't change the tax, over 40% of people increased it and 35% of people decreased it. If you'd seen the answers, however, you were far like, less likely to say that the carbon tax should be decreased and more likely to say either that it shouldn't be changed, it should be left as it is or even increased. This estimate here is about one in four people. Um, so essentially, having engaged with that, those answers from the, from the climate quiz, just seeing them after making your guess, that to one in four people changing their mind on the carbon tax afterwards, that one in four people who otherwise would have said it should be decreased, changed their mind just because they read those quiz answers. 
So uh, just to sum that up, people are less likely to propose a lower carbon tax after engaging with quiz answers. But again, there was no effect of seeing how that revenue is used. Okay, after um, uh, measuring people's support for a carbon tax, we also assessed their willingness to change their own behavior. Um, and these questions were tailored to people. So in one section of the survey, we asked them questions related to their environmental behavior at the moment. For example, which of the following applies to you? Do you drive a, a conventional car, a hybrid car, an electric car, or they, they don't drive? If you had said earlier in the study that you drive a conventional car, one of the questions you were asked was, um, would you, how likely would you be to switch to a hybrid or electric car the next time you buy one? And people rated this from one to seven, uh, seven being extremely likely. So I'm going to give you an example of how people responded to uh, these sort of future intentions questions. We asked multiple different ones. We can group them into the impact they have on the environment. So our low impact behaviors are buying things like um, energy efficient light bulbs, avoiding single use plastics, buying local food. Moderate impact ones are buying energy efficient appliances, switching to a hybrid care, eating less meat and the high impact ones being retrofitting their home, eating no meat or living care free. So the people in our study, they didn't see the classification here. This is our classification for analysis purposes. People were just asked, how likely are you to do this in the future if the question applied to them? Well, you can see with the low impact actions that people um, give quite high ratings of likelihood to this, particularly for, for buying energy efficient light bulbs with an average of, of around six on the scale. If we look at the moderate um, impact actions, they come down a bit lower. So people are uh, more favorable towards buying energy efficient appliances, but things like switching to a hybrid car, eating less meat, they fall around the midpoint of the scale. Turning then to the high impact actions, they're much lower down on the scale. So we see very less likelihood of retrofitting um, their home, cutting out meat entirely if they haven't done so already, um, or living care free if they do have a care. So we can do the same check here on whether seeing the answers through that quiz earlier on in the study made any difference to people's intentions for the future. And I'm gonna group them here by, by the impact that they have on the, on the environment or the average person's um, carbon footprint. So firstly, looking at the, um, the group who didn't see the answers to the quiz compared to the group who did see the answers to the quiz. And you can see that here on average, we have the exact same likelihood of engaging with those low impact behaviors. Turning then to the moderate impact behaviors, no answers to the quiz, followed by answers to the quiz. You can see there's a very, very small difference there between them. When we run our statistical models on these, they do come out as statistically significant, but you can see here um, the effect is very, very small. With the high impact behaviors, here's our no answers condition, and here's the people who saw the answers. Here, Believe it or not, the effect is slightly larger um, than on the moderate impact behaviors. And again, it comes out as statistically significant in the statistical models that we run. But you can see whether this is actually going to have a meaningful impact on, on people's day-to-day -day behavior, probably questionable given just how small this, this effect is. So people are more willing to do moderate and high impact behaviors after engaging with that 10-minute quiz and seeing the answers, but the effect is far smaller than the effect on policy support. To summarize um, these, and I've, I've just kind of given a, um, a few examples of the stuff that I covered in the report. Uh, the report itself goes into, into much more detail as well as on things like sociodemographic differences. Um, but overall, the basics of climate change seem reasonably well understood. The relative contributions less so, um, and we see this in, in, in different questions. So for example, the role of agriculture seems to be underappreciated. Again, that's not a case of people being in denial about agriculture, and it's not an urban rural split. It's just people, uh, a third of people don't think that agriculture is in the top three, whereas um, a third of people believed that the waste sector, for example, might be in the top three, despite it contributing far lower emissions than any other sector. Understanding of the relative impact of different actions, that was also um, quite poor, com especially compared to the other questions, in reasonably well aligned with other countries. So this is something that people sort of um, globally tend to, tend to struggle with. And people also tend to underestimate our per person emissions in Ireland compared to the rest of the EU. Good news is that engaging with climate science increases support for climate policies. And we do want to emphasize here that this was a it was a 10 minute quiz that people are simply shown the answers to afterwards. And this managed to shift people's belief in the carbon tax, which, as I pointed out earlier, tends to be 
quite a controversial um, policy and one that people may not support, um, particularly in the in the the context of the opinion polls earlier. Uh, there's a statistical but far smaller effect on behavioral um, intentions for the future. We do see it on those moderate and um, high impact behaviors. If that scales up, we might uh, see meaningful behavior change. But again, the effects are, are very, very small. All of this and a lot more in the report that was published today. Um, so I've included the, the DOI link there. I would encourage people to, to read it and please feel free to contact us with, with questions. But um, for now, I think we'll, we'll open the Q&A and take some questions on the report itself or on the presentation. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks so much, Shane, and thanks earlier, uh, <clears throat> Pete, as well. So uh, questions are coming in on the uh, Q&A function. Uh, so again, I just remind people uh, that they're very welcome to uh, submit questions and I'll try and pass them on. But can I, can I be begin with a question of my own? Um, and let, let me try and sort of formulate this as best I can. So it, it, it seems when I read that sort of result about um, information and support for the policy, okay, it took me back to the water charges debate. Okay, now people can sort of, you know, argue about the merits, uh, but that was a situation in which the benefits of the policies were explained, how, you know, who was going to be exempted, a whole range of things. Uh, but of course, the, the, the difficulty there from an informational point of view is that there was lots of sort of counter arguments. All right. And it strikes me in the climate area that for, for all the information you provide, there's going to be a whole range of other people who are going to provide sort of different. So it's sort of it's, it's a competition in some ways, um, you know, ar ar around the information that people ab absorb. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like, this, this all makes it sound easy in some sense you, you provide people with the information and they behave in a particular way but the real world is very very different um so i'm, I'm just going to you know uh, it's not quite a criticism it's only just just an observation and i'm just sort of wondering how how would you react to, to that sort of a take on it yeah i'm going to say that is that is a fair point i think what we show is that so engaging it with the information in the format that we use for people so that quiz with this all the answers and they sort of made their guess and it's the sort of potentially seen as the reliable information that led to a shift in behavior whether that translates across the board so if um, politicians for example come out and give the same answers that we presented to people whether people are going to trust and believe that um i think that's an important distinction to make um, the report by the EPA last uh, last month, um, so that showed that people have a high level of trust in scientists. But we do know, and part of the reason that we did this research is that motivated reasoning is a tricky issue. That if some information leads to a conclusion that people dislike, they might downplay that one and favour the information that goes against it. For us, I think, and well, certainly, I don't want to speak for people. For me, this is the first step in testing. Okay, is there any purchase we can get from giving people information? It seems like there is, but those nuances exactly where that information comes from, what happens when it's put up against counter information, I think fertile ground for, for further research. And something that I think, yeah, we'd have great appetite for it. Okay, so let me start getting some of the, the questions <clears throat> from the audience uh, to you. And just apologies to one or two, one or two uh, audience members have, let's say, put in rather long uh, statements, which are kind of difficult uh, to relay. Uh, but let me do my best with as many as we can. So uh, Ronan O'Brien uh, has a question. So are these findings an indictment of the state's failure to run public information campaigns on climate mitigation, focusing on the problems in Ireland, the state's response and how they might assist? So is are you... Uh, are, are you castigating the government or whatever like that for failures? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I don't think so, no. Um, I mean, I think there is an implied criticism that goes far beyond the government, actually, um, about our knowledge on climate change and the seriousness of the issue, uh, which I think you could interpret our results as showing. But I, I would have a much more optimistic take on what we're doing here, and it relates actually to Shane's last answer. I think what's really interesting about this study is it isn't just about providing people with information or educating them. It was probably partly about how they were engaging with it. I suspect it's the fact that they're doing it in the context of a quiz rather than being lectured to or being you know, presented to, but they're actually facing their own lack of knowledge when they're getting the answers and being more aware of that and feeling rather kind of insecure and exposed by the way they themselves are relating to the information that might be important. So going back to what I was saying earlier, I think, I mean, we can't be sure what the psychological mechanism here, but 
behavioral science gives us the ability to run experimental studies that actually start to get at what does it take to get people to really engage and even when they do in different modes and in different ways how can we get some positive purchase out of that and see what what a good way to get them to engage with the issue is and to understand better um, and you know ideally you get yourself in a situation where you see people's opinions and judgments moving at the same time as you can scientifically show that they're becoming um, their, their understanding is growing, they're becoming better informed. So you're actually definitely looking at better informed choices. So I would have a more optimistic view. I think that the climate change problem is incredibly difficult as a policy problem. In my career, I think it's probably the toughest policy problem I've seen, far tougher than water charges, right? Because of the reasons I gave earlier. Um, so no, I don't think it's an indictment, but I think what it does do is it gives us some lessons about how important the issue is and how we have to test and try different ways of engaging people. Okay, we'll keep trying to move quickly because there are a lot of questions. Uh, Jim Thorny uh, has asked. So you, you, you touched on socioeconomic uh, difference, or sorry, socio uh, demographic differences, Shane. Uh, I don't know. Do you, do you have any of them off the top of your head where you can sort of point to some of the interesting differences that emerged across different? Yeah, groups? yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so one of them that came out um, quite clearly across most of the, the outcome variables that we tested was by um, socioeconomic grade. So those on higher income, for example, kind of uh, being more concerned about climate change, more supportive of the tax, uh, performing slightly better in the quiz. And that's even if you control for educational attainment. Um, so it, that was one of the, the findings that came out. And then um, I think I saw there's another question there about gender and age effects. Um, so gender effects came out quite strongly throughout it, where women were more concerned, more willing to change their behavior. We had other measures in there as well about donations to, to environmental charities, women more likely to donate real money um to those charities um although men did slightly better in the in the quiz itself and then there were far fewer age differences in it once we controlled for educational attainment than we might have expected and in fact so there's no difference in terms of knowledge between uh, younger people and, and older people and the older people in the in the sample actually reported being more willing to engage in environmental in in pro-environmental behaviors in the future than the younger people some issues within that is that uh, some of the younger people are more likely to be engaging in those issues now or with those behaviors now. Um, so it's whether you're doing it now versus not is the is the sort of difference there. But yeah, plenty of, uh, of differences across the board. One where we kind of expected, I think, more differences um, from the sort of uh, narrative that you tend to hear was on a, like urban rural um, split, particularly on the agriculture um, questions and there was no differences there so it was within a percentage point or two um, of each other on, on urban rural issues okay <clears throat> thanks for that I, i'm going to try and com combine two points that have been made so D dennis nocton and tina roach uh, have come in with questions and this is sort of a broader i guess behavioral stroke psychological issue uh, so Dennis is, is wondering if sort of any of the, the questions involved uh, the sort of the, the more day to day short term impacts of uh, what we would cons consider sort of, you know, climate change uh, mitigation policies. So the idea is if you're improving air quality, OK, that, you know, impacts immediately. Again, statistic here, 20 percent of kids um, have asthma. OK, so improving air quality has an immediate effect. So presumably when you're designing these sort of experiments that if you have information on immediate effects, I presume that has a sort of a, you know, a, a more immediate impact on people's um, tensions to, so intentions to change their behavior. Uh, but then Tina is asking a question about like wh when it's a sort of a, a catastrophic impact, you know, the difficulty that people might have getting their heads around something like climate change. So I don't know in the questions of the experiments, did you try and sort of balance those sort of uh, immediate effects versus sort of catastrophic effects, which are somewhere in the future, and uh, just sort of capturing that. I mean, it's probably back to the point you were making, Pete, that this is a very complex area, uh, but just wondering if those sort of considerations fa were factored into the experimental design. Yeah, so there is uh, an existing literature out there on what's called psychological distance. Um, so that's kind of getting at this, this somewhat where if people um, perceive the issue to be one that's an issue that only affects the future, for example, um, they're less likely to care about it than if they um, perceive it to be one that's that's more immediate. Um, there are there have been experiments done to try and make it seem like it's more immediate, so using sort of images and so on. Um, in what we measured was whether, uh, so we focused on the, the solutions to climate change or the ways to mitigate against it. 
one of the questions we asked people was um, whether they thought the uh, mitigative effects or any policies that are put in place or any actions, would, they, would there be benefits from them in the now or in the short term? Or would they be in the long term? And that's something that people seem quite uncertain about. So there's almost a 50-50 split um, between people expecting the benefits in the short term versus the long term. So that's the focus we took on it in terms of the scale. I think, as sort of Pete mentioned as well, and those questions allude to the, the complexity of the issue, multiple other questions that I think we would have liked to include in the in the survey, and hopefully that we, we get to do something along those lines in the future ones. Um, but I imagine Pete might have a bit to, to add on that. Yeah, I mean, for this first study, all we'd really done, as Shane says, is we'd looked across a broad range and we tried to get a sort of representative set of questions, I suppose. I mean, one of the things I would love to do, actually, is to study this from an intergenerational perspective and you know, run a study that is specifically about the importance of intergenerational framing and long-term issues as opposed to shorter term day-to-day -day issues, because I suspect the psychology is quite different and I suspect successful framing and understanding may differ between people from the short to the long-term issues. So those kind of differences for this first study would, would be on the scope of what we were trying to do, but we'd love to do more on it um i just sorry if i could just follow up on that journey, point yeah. we actually do have a project funded by the epa that's um uh where we're going to be assessing those sort of generational framing issues among young people um so yeah sort of watch this space excellent good to hear um uh, Pete, I see you're looking at your screen. I don't. If you're seeing questions that you really want to answer, let me know. I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit because I'm trying to get a, a sort of a, a variety uh, of questions. But I said, if, if, if you see anything that, that you, you really want to address, let me know. Uh, what I do want to put to you both, and this is from our colleague, uh, Fran McGinnity, it's an issue that comes up a lot in, in your experimental designs. And it's the question of how long lasting uh, the effects are. So, I mean, is it simply the case that you confront somebody with it in the lab or that they walk out the door and uh, th these things are different? So any, any sense of how long lasting the effects are that, you, that you're observing? I'll go if you like. Oh, it's a great question. Of course it is. Um, and if you made me bet, I would bet it's had a short term influence followed by a decay function um on average um so that the effect would just gradually recede into the background um there'd be some evidence in the psychological literature that it would have a, a much smaller more permanent effect that there's a kind of cumulative process and perhaps for some individuals it would have a larger effect that did last but on average you're going to see an immediate effect followed by some degree of decay would be what literature would suggest i um, mean it really is worth saying this is just a 10 minute quiz Right. So it's a kind of indication of the psychological mechanisms one can tap into. And we're not we're not suggesting this is some sort of you know life changing intervention that we want to roll out. Although I would say that I think quizzes in general are extremely useful ways to get information across to people in ways that are sort of less dull for people to engage with. And a lot of people are using them more as behavioral interventions with some success. And we're keen to do the same, for example, with kind of financial products and this kind of stuff, as well as in areas of environmental concern. Okay, next question from Maeve O'Reilly, which I am going to read because it's kind of just a sentence long and manageable. So there seems to be a bit of cognitive dissonance in that people are aware of the problem but don't want to take action that will inconvenience them. So is there any optimistic research on engaging with these people? So again, I suppose this came up in your results again. You, sh you shifted uh, support for, for carbon taxes, uh, but, but, but less movement it seemed then on, on the sort of actions that people themselves were willing to take. So uh, any, any uh, the uh, Maeve is asking for positive research, optimistic research. Uh, do we know how to how to change more individual level actions? Yeah, so I think uh, some source of optimism actually comes from that direct finding on the the policy support. Um, so I think we were kind of surprised by the size of the effect that people were willing to to sort of be open to that um, climate information. I think in terms of the individual behavior change, we did see sort of that small purchase, but the, the, if you remember the information we gave people wasn't necessarily targeted at that. There's plenty of further research that I think could be done to sort of look at more targeted ways to shift that individual level action. Um, I agree that so the, the motivation for the study was exactly that sort of cognitive dissonance that we see that people might recognize the problem, but not necessarily be willing to take on that information that suggests they should do something about it. And particularly if that's an effortful action to to engage in. Um, but from these results, at least people sort of were willing to take on that information and then say, OK, you can you can charge me a bit more for my petrol to do something about it. Um, so there's some optimism there. We don't exactly have the answers right now, but some optimism at least. 
Okay, another <clears throat> general question. John Highland is asking the question, but it's, it's come up from another uh, number of people. So how do you foresee that the results could be used in real world application communication campaigns that address the different values people have? Okay, so I suppose it's a question of sc scaling it up from the experiment to um, public information type campaigns. If I'm completely honest, uh, I think the answer is that you can't really. I mean, this is dipping our toe in the water to start. So I think it gives some indications about the kind of simplicity of information and the way and ways to engage people that are helpful. And I think it gives us baseline data on what people know now. So it, tell, it allows you to kind of target and say, well, look, we know we've got good baseline data on what people do understand well and what they understand less well. So it's useful. But I don't think it, you can deduce from it the right way to go about it. I think it takes an awful lot more research over a sustained period of time, which is part of the point I was sort of trying to make at the start. I mean, I would love to see studies specifically done on technology adoption and in fact, specifically done on the different components of technology adoption where, you know, we look explicitly at people's comprehension in those spaces, look for the gaps, look for interventions that potentially change perceptions and make them more accurate and make people understand better. So you can talk about retrofitting, you can talk about electric vehicles, you can talk about changes in the agricultural sector. I mean, each one of them requires a, a degree of human beings engaging with complexity in a way that allows them to genuinely process the world differently if we want their behavior to change and be willing to make changes. So I think this is just a start and it gives a few indications at a very general level, but there's a huge amount more work to do if you look at the complexity of the problem. Okay, thanks uh, for that. I'm still sure like, lots and lots of questions. Another interesting one, uh, Phelan Moshe, so the question is, would you see this research supporting the case for better incentives, encouraging pro-environmental behaviors, rather than relying too heavily on information provision? Uh, so I think I've chosen that because I'm particularly interested in that, in, in that myself. I mean, at one level, you are finding that providing people with more information you know, will encourage better behaviors, <clears throat> uh, but relative to substantial taxes, subsidy, you know, the real carrot and stick approach, um, do, do you have a sense of you know where where, where the, the real action comes from in, in terms of change? I really want to come in on this. Uh, there is nothing in our findings or in a behavioural approach to climate change that suggests you shouldn't use the price mechanism as a primary method to alter people's incentives. I mean, almost every behavioural economist I know who works in this area, while they think that behavioural economics has a really important role to play, they also think orthodox economics and changing people's incentives has a really important role to play, and so do I. I mean, I think you cannot solve this problem without changing people's material incentives, as well as dealing with issues of perception and comprehension and collective action and willingness to change and all of the things that we're talking about here. And it's not an either or. Um, so I don't think the word instead belongs here. I think it's an and. Um, and what I would definitely see is that one of the reasons we focused, in fact, on the carbon tax is because changes in incentives are going to be such an important part of the solution. And almost every serious economist who looks at this believes that then the behavioral side of that and how people understand the tax and what their beliefs about its effectiveness are and all that stuff about the fairness of how it's redistributed. All of those behavioral questions become really, really important alongside that change in incentives. Okay, uh, Sarah New York has a question. Um, there's two parts of it, so I'll read them out. Okay, so retrofitting your home and changing to an electric vehicle are two high cost measures that may simply not be affordable for a lot of people. So, was the cost of making certain possible necessary lifetime changes considered? Okay, so again, just, just hold that thought in your head. I'll ask the second bit actually, though, Shane, because it is kind of related. The second bit is was the importance of how a car is viewed as a status wealth symbol? Uh, considered. I always think that's an interesting one. I always think that could be pro uh, EVs and that maybe people like the idea of being seen to have a, you know, from a, a well status perspective, having a uh, an EV sitting in the driveway. But anyway, Shane, did, did you want to back on those? Yeah, so um, there, the questions that we asked that related to the high impact behaviours, I think they are um, sort of irrevocably combined with the effort that goes into them and the cost that goes into them. I'm not sure there are many high impact um, pro environmental behaviours that are low effort if you're um so obviously there's there's uh cost restrictions there but there are some grants available that um, might make it more accessible for some people if you really enjoy eating meat there's going to be a high cost to cutting out your meat intake if you really like traveling there's going to be a high cost to traveling so the, i think the the high impact behaviors are necessarily high effort 
Um, there is some other research that was published recently that used similar types of questions that we had that does look at exactly the sort of effort that people perceive from them. So I do think that's that's an important question. We didn't measure in this study the effort that people perceived um, from the different actions. We've just kind of taken them as if it's high effort, it's going to be if it's high impact, it's going to be high effort. Um, and that kind of that kind of scales up. And then in terms of the, the social status of, of driving, I think that's um, so it's not something we looked at for, for this one. I agree that, that those are the same as the sort of signal that I'm driving the EV um, might be a sort of social mechanism for adoption among some circles. Um, but I think that kind of thing probably needs to be watched for any sort of backfire effects and sort of with the, the problem of climate change that we're trying to address is probably not something that we want to be dividing people into groups over. Uh, I'm going to read out a, a question from Paul Price, um, and I'm, I'm going to add this in just from a sort of a different perspective. Um, perspective. Uh, so, is there a mainstream economics bias in the climate science survey question set, as if carbon taxes and individual behaviour are somehow key solutions? Okay, so Paul goes on to say, from the physical climate science, um, there's a global carbon budget total of carbon that can ever be burned. And it, uh, essentially what we have, actually, it's, it's a rationing problem. Uh, therefore, for future work, would it be good to focus on the fairness rationing aspects of carbon budgeting policy? So I guess, uh, Paul, is the, the, the different argument is not about incentives and how the economists think about it. It's about setting a uh, just a particular level of, of, of a carbon budget and rationing it uh, accordingly. So we can go, I don't know if you want to address that straight off, Peter. Yes, I mean, I, I, look, I, I think some degree of rationing and regulation has a role to play in this as well. Um, my own personal view um, is that if you don't use market mechanisms to some extent, you are never going to solve this problem. And that view comes from reading multiple economists, perhaps particularly Dieter Helm's view in the UK, which I would be a fan of his work. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to summarize that now. I mean, you know, that's just based on reading a lot of papers and books. And I would form the view ultimately that we have to use market mechanisms. And one of the reasons I think that's true is because the rationing problem is too complex for governments to solve. Um, and it's also too complex for individuals to solve, to rely on individuals to make uh, factor in climate impacts into their judgment. So the price mechanism acts as a shorthand. It helps us. In fact, the price summarizes really important information provided the market mechanisms are set. Uh, and of course, there are going to be issues there. Of course, markets are imperfect. I'm a behavioral economist. I mean, of course, I think markets are imperfect, but also I think that they can at times radically and importantly shift people's behavior. And I think if you don't use that in these circumstances, you're going to really struggle. But clearly, some degree of kind of rationing and regulation is important. I do want to make one more point here, though, which is I'm very, very skeptical about this idea that at some central level, one can decide targets and then push the problem of hitting those targets down into sectors and down onto people, rather than actually devise mechanisms that are gonna generate those changes, which is where economists become really important and where things like taxes and subsidies um, and price mechanisms become really important. I'm extremely skeptical of our ability to do it. And actually, I think 30 years of watching countries set targets while we endlessly watch the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere go up at a very, very steady rate would support that view. Okay, thanks for that. Now, it's funny, we did say at the start of this, there was great not to be talking about uh, COVID, uh, but then I, I see a question here with the word COVID in it, but it's actually a very good question. It's, it's from Deirdre Joyce, and I think it is, it's, it's worth hearing your reflections on it. What lessons can be learned from behavioral science information messaging from COVID? So I'm, I'll jump in at this um, just to, to kick things off. I think it's something that we've we've thought a lot about um, over the last, I nearly said a year, over the last two years, um, particularly as we kept trying to pick up um, this research. I think one of the things that has said to me the most um, from our from our COVID work has been the importance of recognizing that we don't necessarily know what message is going to land with the public and what's driving their behavior that we've needed to, to measure it um, at every point. What we've seen from our COVID stuff is that worry is important, the perception of what other people are doing is important, um, the perceived burden of restriction, so that whether that's worth trading off against protect, preventing the spread of the virus, those kinds of things are important. And you can imagine that they would have lessons that would translate quite well over into climate change, but it's a completely different problem in terms of what we were discussing earlier with the, the impact of climate change and when that is happening. So I think we can, there's plenty of, evidence now for us to generate new hypotheses for that could then be tested when it comes to, um, to the difference between COVID and, and climate change. 
one that um, we have thought about quite a bit and presented on a few times as well. Actually, before you come in, Pete, um, there's a related question uh, from Hans Zomer. Uh, and Hans is making reference to the, the difficulties in this area that sometimes people think, firstly, their actions don't make a difference. Okay, and secondly, uh, if other people aren't doing certain things, why should you? Now, it sort of strikes me that that there's a sort of a there's a parallel with some of the uh, the COVID public messaging as well. But do, do you want to pick up the, the the broader question? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, adding to what Shane has said, um, as I've said ad nauseum when people are sick of hearing me say about COVID being a collective action problem and that there being an entire science for how to solve collective action problems well guess what climate change is a collective action problem and some of the lessons do translate but those are lessons actually behavioral scientists have known for about 30 years it's about applying them in the specific context and um, so we do know how to support people to cooperate and we do know that people will cooperate willingly themselves and make sacrifices for the greater good provided they can see exactly why they need to do it and why if everyone does it, it'll work and provided they see other people doing it as well. But of course, those provided are incredibly difficult to engineer. So people will cooperate for the greater good. They will change their behavior for in a public spirited manner, but you have to set all of these conditions and, and get them right in order for that to happen. So I think there are some parallels there. I think they're really useful parallels, um, but they don't offer silver bullet solutions very easily at all. They require each component of those collective action problems to be researched really carefully and um, for messaging to be devised ac accordingly and for systems to be devised accordingly that are really fair and allow collective action to actually work. Okay, so listen, we're, we're, we're coming towards the end, uh, but I'm, I'm just going to gather up a, a, a big number of questions which go, all go on the same issue, which is kind of what next? Um, so I know that's rather broad, but if, if, if you sort of, and you touched on this at the start, Pete, but you're, you're sort of hopes and dreams now for the next uh, while, what, what, what are the sort of issues uh, and, and the sort of studies you're, you're hoping to conduct uh, to further our sort of knowledge in this area? So I, I have on my screen sitting right here a whiteboard that the Behavioural Research Unit did together on what our wish list would be for what we want to do um, on climate change as a behavioural research unit. Uh, at 12.58, I cannot possibly go through the 12 studies that we decided we really wanted to do, uh, which were the result of that whiteboard session. But what I would say is the stuff on there about technology adoption, the stuff on there about how you frame intergenerational problems, the stuff on there about giving people specific feedback about their behaviour and allowing them to interact with technology like apps and so on that help them to make more environmentally friendly decisions. Um, so... You know, there's stuff about uh, how you frame persuasive messages, uh, the stuff about whether you are in danger of crowding out the really big changes people need to make by pushing them into making multiple smaller changes that aren't as effective. So there's a huge number of research questions that we would love to hit where we think behavioral science has a real contribution to make. Um, so as I say, this is a first step um, and that question's very helpful for me giving the little ad for what we think we might be able uh, to do in the future, but I think that's only four of the 12. No worries. Well, listen, it is now, it's at 12.59 according to my uh, computer, so we, we better uh, bring things to a close. So listen, sincere, sincere thanks, Shane, and uh, Pete, fantastic report and great great presentation and, and great engagement. Uh, tons of sort of, I, I was reading the, uh, the the questions, but tons of complimentary uh, remarks uh, about the study as well. So uh, congratulations to you both uh, on that. And by the sound of things, we'll be hearing plenty more uh, from you both in this and your other colleagues uh, in this area. So with that, uh, uh, say goodbye and wish everybody a good afternoon. Thank you.